free lash uh, man and so on. But the donors have a completely different type of strategy uh, in, in their marriage uh, uh, choices. There's only one of these 100, uh, uh, only one of these 85 donors that is actually identified by the skin, by her skin color and by her former uh, social condition. Uh, she's the only donna on top of that to have married somebody who is also specifically identified in the register by skin color. This is Dona Dionisia Teodora Silva, a part of Fora from Rio de Janeiro, not local born, uh, from Rio de Janeiro, who marries uh, also a part foro or free black male from Bahia. So she's from Rio, he's from uh, the Brazilians. In other words. Military personnel also constitute one of the groups that are preferred by donors as uh, marriage partners. These could be simple soldiers or low-level officers, as was the case, for example, of Antonio José Gaspar, who happened to be the ensign of the Enrique's regiment and marries Dona Caetana Gomes Cabral uh, in November of 1810. They can also be, uh, by the way, mid-level uh, military officers, but we don't see any high, high-end military officers getting married here in this particular um, uh, place. So beyond the, the, uh, the soldiers, the majority of, Do of Dona's uh, marriage partners appear in the register as <coughs> individuals who have no particular socio socioeconomic characteristics uh, attributed to them. This is the case, for example, of the 82 of the 100 groups. We know very little about them. Nevertheless, we know what their broad traits are. The Donnas were simply not at all interested, attracted to men that were born within the port town or in the interior. There's only 18 individuals that fall under this category. What the Donnas are favoring, on the other hand, is by and large, outsiders. Outsiders, that is, males who migrate to Bengala from elsewhere. At least 10 of them have been born in Luanda. Another group of 19 had first seen the, the light of day in Brazil. And there's no less than 22 of them that have Portugal as their country of birth. In other words, out of every 10 partners, a maximum of six were outsiders. And whether they originated from Luanda, Bengala, uh, uh, pardon me, Luanda, Portugal, or Brazil, these foreigners always made their way to Bengala for very particular reasons. One was the success that could be had from engaging in the town's major economic activity, i.e., the slave trade. Another was to carry out their duties as colonial soldiers or administrators. And the third, of course, was to serve out their sentences as religious, political, or even criminal uh, convicts. So for obvious reasons, Donnas would not have been particularly interested in marrying convicts. As we have seen, on the other hand, soldiers, particularly officers, did represent attractive possibilities. But the most important pool of marriage partners was, of course, uh, the Portuguese, the Brazilian individuals who come to Bengala in search of wealth through uh, the slave trade. So who are these uh, donors? So these donors are almost always exclusively marrying these folks from, uh, out, these men from outside of uh, Bengala. There's very few of them that, as I, said, as I mentioned earlier, who are marrying men that are born in Bengala or indeed in the uh, 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 hinterland. And there's also a very important group of these donors, however, that are not themselves locally born. So there's two types of donors that you have here. You have amongst this group that is seeking foreign male uh, uh, partners. One, of, one group is made up of women who are born in Bengal. Another significant group of these donors is actually born in the interior of Bengal. They are coming to Bengal to get married. They are coming to Bengal to seek out their partners. And once again, they're coming to Bengal to seek out partners who are predominantly foreign born, or at least born outside of this uh, uh, region. So this brings into question a whole series of issues uh, with respect to the way that these women have been gener generically portrayed 
as being essentially urban coastal uh, individuals. And in this case, we are seeing for the first time a, an urban population that is absolutely unable, from a demographic point of view, to produce enough donors. That is, to produce enough, enough donors to marry all of these uh, foreign guys that are uh, debarking off uh, the ships. So uh, another group of women from the interior who are in themselves part of the interior elites are now migrating into Bengali in order to take up the, the slack. This opens up, uh, opens up the room for the elites of the interior, which are not always the same as the elites on the coast, to infiltrate that coastal elite, but also, more importantly, to, to articulate economically, but also socially, culturally, and so on, between the interior supplying slaves to the coast and, of course, the Atlantic world uh, sucking in all of those slaves. I'll stop there and we can go um, uh, at it um, in more detail um, during the question period. Thank you.
Thus, the study covers a period of time in which Lutso African social institutions surrounding the Catholic Church were being constantly negotiated and reconstructed. The main sources I will be using are two registers of abuses covering the years 1770 to 1789 and 1787 to 1795, respectively. This presentation will deal with the latter register. These registers were written by Catholic clerics, usually from Portugal, and they contain brief accounts of the people who died, as well as information about their burials. Overall, there are approximately 850 to 900 entries spanning 25 years, and the number of deaths recorded a year actually increases over time. These registers represent paid burials of typically Christian members of the community. Unfortunately, there are some problems in regards to the condition of the sources, and some sections of the text have become illegible. We'll also be looking at a geographical survey of the hinterlands surrounding Bengala, written by Joaquim José de Silva, starting in 1785, which contains a description of what he calls an entambi ritual, uh, the burial of a Saba, some weeks south of Bengala in the Kilangs region, and Elias Alessandro de Silva Crea's Historia de Angola, which contains an account of entambi within the district of Bengala. I will also look at a variety of travel journals from the 1830s onward that, while not contemporary to these sources, contain further descriptions of funerals and comment on the persistence of local practices in the face of a growing Catholic influence. These sources are highly colored with disdain for any non-European practice, but they nonetheless include key descriptive insights into the space and meaning of death in regions nearby Bengala which, which, with which there would have been significant trade. And on the map there you can see the first uh, red circle is Bengala and the, the lower one is Kilangs. So you can kind of see the area around there. This map's from uh, 1860. It has been a tendency of historians when examining slave trade ports to ignore the impact of the connections port towns have with their hinterland and instead focus entirely on these towns as solely part of the Atlantic trade network. And I hope that the use of these sources will partially address this concern in my study. Both Mariana Candido and Rafael de Ferreira have used death rituals as examples in their examinations of cultural negotiation in Angola. Based almost entirely on Carrera's account, Candido has said, in this Atlantic port, residents lived a religiously syncretic lifestyle, combining Catholic, Catholic baptism within Tambe and Catholic weddings with polygamy. Similarly, and based on the same sources, Ferreira has claimed that to commemorate the passing of relatives or acquaintances, free and enslaved residents of Luanda followed a wide range of other African religious practices, including in Tambes, which entailed gathering at the house of the deceased for eight days. While these statements reflect the undeniable fact that a variety of cultural elements were present within Bengala, they oversimplify a complex process of cultural negotiation in which individuals at a specific local level had a variety of social identities which impacted how they engaged in both Catholic and local practices and how their identities were constantly reproduced. Furthermore, it is clear from these registers that many individuals in Bengala would have been denied participation in Catholic rituals and similarly, that many Catholics disparaged customs from the hinterland. In terms of methodology, I am creating a database of these 800 plus entries in order to clearly see patterns and provide strong quantitative evidence to back up what I interpret from these patterns and the literary aspects of the entries. So far, I have completed the database for the 1787 to 1795 register, which includes 432 entries, and this is just an example. As of now, my database has 23 categories. Instead of explaining each category, I would like to move on to explaining some of my major findings and arguments, but please feel free to ask for clarification about a particular category. Before examining specific findings within these registers, I would like to take a moment to establish a demographic outline of this Luso Catholic community and attempt to quantify the presence of death within that community. Between the years 1787 and 1795, an average of 64.5 burials were recorded per year. A smoothed average comes out to 72 deaths per year. Of these deaths, 41.4% were infants, an alarmingly high rate, and these infants I'll uh, call in genos from now on. The population of Bengala at this time has been estimated at between 1,500 and 3,000 people. On average, censuses from the turn of the 19th century claim that there are approximately 100 white men and women in the town at any given time. Even if the Catholic community extended far beyond these reported whites, the fact remains that a very significant percentage of this elite Luso Catholic community was dying every year. Furthermore, the registers give evidence that scientific knowledge of the causes of death was limited. Only in two cases are Ill names of illnesses provided. 
Considering the volume of death and the lack of understanding as to its causes, it is clear that death loomed large in this community and its members were unable to control it. The registers provide a substantial in insight into the sex, color, and status of those who fit into this Christian community. Of the adults buried, 69.9% were men and 30.1% were women. 51.1% of the women with recorded burials were listed as pretas, with another 20% named as donnas. Thus, there were very few white women, but a surprisingly high percentage of free and enslaved black women. Conversely, only 11.8% of men buried were pretos. With very few men in the register, very few men in the registers had a color listed, but their occupations, places of origin, and wealth suggest that they would have been considered white. 15% of adults listed were slaves. It is clear that, particularly in the case of women, the Catholic community in Bengala stretched far beyond white settlers and administrators. The prevalence of Preta women with expensive burials suggests that sexual and or domestic relationships between white men and black women were spaces in which cultural negotiations took place. Turning now to rituals of death and the negotiation of piety, one category that is recorded very frequently in the registers is the administration of sacraments to the dying. And genos typically receive no sacraments, almost as if they were considered a separate category of death, which happens to be similar to what we know about many other African religious practices. Whites often receive both penitence and extreme unction before their deaths. However, in cases where the deceased had a disease, they were often too sick to receive another important sacrament, the viaticum, which is a ceremony of last rites which involves a procession where the dying takes communion. One of the most interesting aspects of the sacraments is some entries, in some entries is the cleric's reaction when masters fail to ensure that their slaves receive sacraments before death. The recording clerics refer to this as great neglect. This is ironic for two reasons. First of all, in these situations, the masters obviously care, care enough about the deceased to secure expensive burials for them despite their status as slaves, yet do not bother giving them something considered crucial for Christians. Secondly, the clerics have no problem with slavery as a practice, but they are shocked by the idea of a Christian being buried without sacraments. This is consistent with the Baroque Catholicism prevalent in Portugal at the time, and similar to what Zhao José Reis finds in a similar study in Bahia. Other ritual indicators of status apparent in the sources include whether or not the deceased is encomendado or commended by a priest, which is overlooked in rare cases, usually for anginos, only about 67.6% .6 and genos were encomendado compared to 94.7% of all adults, whether they are accompanado or their burial is accompanied, i.e. an actual funeral, which, which tends to only occur for the more wealthy, and whether they named an executor and gave a will and testament. Another category frequently recorded and thus likely considered important to the clerics is clothes worn by the dead when they are interred. In Bahia, Rice argues that the more African a person is, the more likely they were to be buried in white. At first glance, my evidence would seem to support his theory. Only rarely does an entry refer to someone being buried in something other than white. And that's usually uh, habitos of ecclesiastical order for the rich, or um, various fabrics in red and blue for anginos. However, Rice's argument is based on spotty evidence about white clothing in African burials. While some areas in Africa indeed have traditions of using white, the Entambi ritual and several others refer to the dead being wrapped in a black ox skin, and white is by no means consistently used across the continent or even within West Central Africa. Other explanations for the prevalence of white, prevalence of white fabric include practical reasons, the cost of cloth, uh, white as a fertility symbol in a society where death is so common, and possibly an attempt to buy whiteness among a Christian community. Either way, burial in white was clearly important, showing how ritualized death clothing became in this community. The dead were also almost always buried with a personalized cross. The final major aspect of my research involves the space of death. The dead were almost, sorry, my title, Intero Hello Mort Deus, is a quotation from the sources, which translates as buried by the love of God and is used to explain why a poor person has been granted burial space inside a church so close to God. Burials inside a church was seen, according to ideologies of Baroque Catholicism, as crucial in securing an afterlife close to God. This trend is clearly seen in Bengala, where life was so precarious. Securing space in a church was a way of controlling the uncontrollable. It was also something that could be purchased. 
European accounts from the early 1800s have also indicated that bodies that were not buried within gates would be torn apart by hyenas at night. Thus, the practicality of saving a body physically aligned well with Catholic symbolism. The most common burial location for Anginos was Noaja, or in the churchyard. The less wealthy Portuguese and most pretos listed were often buried Some black and colored people were able to secure a place inside the church by joining their mandatas, or brotherhoods, which were organizations designed to secure religious rights for their members. Some individuals interred in El Senor de Populo were members of the Brotherhood of Santo Antonio de Catargona, a Bahia Brace Brotherhood created with the main purpose of allowing black and mulatto Christians spaces within churches upon death. Members would pay dues and in turn receive this burial space, as well as a tumba or buyer, to be carried to the church upon and accompaniment for their funerals. It is clear that burial space was important not just among wealthy whites. Indeed, as in several other places in Africa, it seems likely that security in the afterlife may have been a primary reason for conversion to Christianity. To problematize the issue of space inside the church, it is important to remember that the majority of the population were free, freed, or enslaved blacks whose bodies were buried in mass graves or burned. Unfortunately, looking at this is somewhat outside of the scope of my current study. In the Entabi ritual, Sabas are said to have been buried in close compounds with their ancestors, which shows that space was equally important outside of the Catholic community in Bengala. Other studies across the continent show a trend of the dead being buried inside ancestral homes before churches created cemeteries and colonial governments passed sanitation laws, which attempted to control the space occupied by the dead. In conclusion, I am producing this small-scale study in order to create a potential framework that could be used for future study, perhaps in areas with public records that represent a larger portion of the population, such as Luanda. What emerges from this study is the clear notion that status, in terms of piety and wealth, was negotiated by individuals in Bengala to secure space that was respected and close to God, proper sacraments, and rituals, including clothing, in order to have some notion of security over the afterlife in a place where death was so common and uncontrollable. I believe that these documents also provide insights into societal relationships, such as the cleric-master-slave relationship, and indeed expand historical knowledge on the formation of Luso-African society. to become part of nobility. 
especially with the changes undertaken in the administration of the Marquis of Pombal, the negotiations in large quantities, grossos cabedais, lost its pejorative meaning, including the slave trade, and the negotiantes became fit to, to join the Portuguese nobility. Far from the stigma of traficantes, smugglers, common in the Brazilian vocabulary after the pro prohibition of the activity, these homens de negócios were, indeed, respectful businessmen who operated the monstrous market of souls, to quote Fragoso. Only after 1850, with the Lei Eusebio de Queiroz, the slave trade was efficiently disassembled while the negreiros became to be treated as pirates. Well, a little bit about the, uh, this is Antonio José de Barros, uh, the guy that I studied. This is his uh, actual signature in one of the documents I found. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the research, uh, the development of this research. Antonio José de Barros has seen, has been, for quite some years now, since 2002, the main character of, the, of my research on the community of slave traders of Benguela. Starting with him, it was possible to track down many of his relatives and business partners evidencing the wide range of his influence and commercial contacts. The research reveals that Barros had contacts in the most important ports of the Portuguese Atlantic. O Porto, Lisbon, Pernambuco, Bahia, Rio de Janeiro, and Luanda are ports on which he had compadres and business partners. He, also, uh, he was also associated with several sertanejos and cumbeiros who led the slave caravans inland, reaching as far as the Bahia. Uh, the trajectory of this major slave trader and of his relatives and partners has been assembled through careful research in archives located on the two continents he lived on. Uh, it started at the Portuguese archives, Torre do Tombo, Arquivo Histórico Tramarino, and Biblioteca da Marinha. In Brazil, I have traced information about him, him at the archives of the Instituto Histórico Geográfico Brasileiro and through the Projeto Resgate and the Centro de Memória Digital of the University of Brasilia. Now, through the Angola Has Got group, I, have the, I had the opportunity to track down more information about Antonio José de Barros, his relatives and associates at the Arquivo Histórico Nacional de Angola. It is important to say that Antonio José de Barros features in different uh, historiographic works as one of the most powerful slave traders of Angola. The first of them is the classic work of the Angola historian Ralph Delgado, Reino de Benguela, from 1945 which presents, for the first time, the now famous list of the main slave traders of Benguela from 1791. Later on, the same list was reproduced in a paper presented by Professor José Curto in 2003 in a seminar at the Harriet Tubman Institute entitled Movers of Slaves, the Brazilian Community in Benguela. The list is also presented by Rocinaldo Ferreira in his PhD dissertation in 2003 by Rosa Cruz de Silva, current Minister of Culture of Angola, in an article from 2004, and finally by Mariana Cândido on her PhD dissertation in 2006. The main character of my presentation today, Feliciano José de Barros, son of Antonio, is also uh, present in the works of Ferreira e Cândido. Ferreira briefly comments on the birth of Feliciano in his PhD, 2003, and in a recent article from 2012, Mariana Cândido deals with Feliciano and Antonio José de Barros, providing new valuable information about one of Barros' slaves, named Francisca José and their daughter, Joana. Data about Barros' relatives and compadres can also be found in the works of Ralph Delgado, José Curto, and Joseph Miller. Besides these Africanists, information provided by other historians of Brazil and of the Atlantic have helped me trace some of the partners of Antônio José de Barros in Rio de Janeiro, among them the works of Maria Beatriz Neza da Silva, Manolo Florentino, João Fragoso, and Ireu Cavalcante. Well, this is uh, the Barros family, right? You can see Antônio José de Barros is the third son there in the middle. Uh, Antônio José de Barros was born in the city of Porto in 1760. He was the third son of an important homem de negócios and captain called Antônio da Costa Barros Guimarães. Along with his older brothers and in-laws, Antônio José de Barros operated from Benguela to many parts of the Atlantic world. He began his career at a very young age and soon became an important trader, holding big accounts in the market of Rio de Janeiro since he was 17 years old. Around 1780, he transferred his activities to the port of Benguela. He then began working uh, for the Portuguese administration in Angola, first as an ajudante da Companhia de Auxiliares de Benguela and later as Sargento Mor de Benguela. In this position, he got hold of a small troop of soldiers 
that were certainly used to increment his slave negotiation in, in the Sertões. In less than a decade, Antonio José de Barros became one of the most important slave traders in operation in that region, stretching his network from Benguela to the to from the port to the Benguela Plateau uh, and, and to different points in the Atlantic. In Rio de Janeiro, Antonio José de Barros was a member of four religious orders and of a series of sociedades. His family was associated with one of the biggest negotiators of the 18th century, a powerful man named Faustino de Lima. Barros engaged in several negotiations with the members of the Lima's family and inherited the debts his father had with them. After the death of Faustino, the Barros family kept on trading with his successor in the family, a business, a negociante called uh, Domingos Rebeiro Pereira. Uh, Antonio José de Barros began his career accompanying his father and brothers to learn more about the family business. Once, while traveling to Rio de Janeiro, he stayed at the house of Domingos Rebeiro Pereira. There, he met a mulatto slave named Ana, who belonged to his host. The young Antonio José became uh, interested in her, and in order to get to know her better, he promised that, in case she got pregnant, he would free her and the child. According to Barros' own words, uh, he then managed to engage sinful communications with the slave Ana. Sometimes after this communication, uh, Ana informed Barros she was pregnant and asked him uh, to keep his promise and free her. Uh, but Barros, based on the argument she was not a virgin when he had met her, and that she had other children, decided to confess to the priest about his sin before making any decision about the future of Anna. The priest, informed by the fact that Anna was not a virgin, absolved Barros from his sin and freed him from uh, the promise he had made. Uh, bearing a clean conscience, uh, Barros embarked to Benguela and forgot about Anna and the child she carried in her womb. This event must have happened when Barros was around 15 or 16 years old, once he mentions his relationship with Domingo Rebelo Pereira, who died in 1776. By 1780, Barros was already uh, based in Benguela, and during the entire decade, he worked hard to ascend socially in that community. In 1789, he became Sergeant Mor uh, of Benguela and an influent man, financing the construction of the city's first hospital. Uh, he also built his commercial house in Benguela, where he lived with 22 slaves, being 14 male and 8 female, and from where he organized um, his many activities. Antonio José de Barros owned some real estate in Benguela, and also small farms next to the Catumbela River, where he produced food for his house and business. These crops of beans and corn were also used to supply his ship with the necessary provisions for the Atlantic crossings. Barros owned a corvette named Pensamento Feliz, a fast type of ship that became very popular among slave traders in the South Atlantic in the second half of the 18th century. Now, to finish, I'm going to talk a little bit about the trajectory of his son, his illegitimate son, Feliciano José de Barros. Uh, as I previously mentioned, Feliciano was born in Rio de Janeiro sometime around mid-1770s. His mother belonged to one of the major negotiators of that city, Domingo Ribeiro Pereira. There is no information about the life of Ana after she was abandoned by Barros, but it is certain that she was kept in Pereira's house where she gave birth to Feliciano. As informed by Antonio José de Barros in his will, Feliciano was allegedly baptized at the Freguesia da Candelaria as his son, even without his previous recognition. After the death of Domingos Rebelo Pereira, the young slave and his mother must have passed on to his successor, the negociante carioca Francisco de Araújo Pereira. Uh, just show here, this is the family of Faustino, right? We have Domingos uh, uh, Pereira here, and then these are his successor, Francisco de Araújo Pereira. Uh, now, uh, no, no, no. Captain Barros might have kept attending the former house of Rebelo Pereira, now administrated by Francisco de Araújo Pereira. In fact, one of Antonio José de Barros' legitimate sons, named João, lived in Rio de Janeiro at the house of a son of Araújo Pereira, named Narciso Luiz Alves Pereira. There is a great possibility, therefore, that Feliciano knew about his half-brother João, and maybe even met him. If this is so, it would not be difficult for Feliciano to track down precise information about his father's whereabouts. Uh, 
Some t somewhere around the decade of 1790, when the Sargento Mo Antonio Sergio Barros had already become an important member of the community of Daniela, Feliciano decided to embark to West Central Africa after his father. According to the captain himself, many years after his affair with the slave Anna, a young man began, began spreading the word in Benguela that he was the son of the Sargento Mo. Feliciano was summoned before Barros to explain himself and he, he revealed that he was the reject offspring of that sinful communication with the slave Anna. Once again, Captain Barros faced the promise he had made several years before, but this time he did not uh, break it. He freed Feliciano and included him, along with his other legitimate sons, as part of his will and of his heritage. Antonio Sete Barros is still informed us that in his will that his uh, son and former slave had returned to Rio de Janeiro and had been back to Benguela a while ago, suggesting Feliciano became another uh, traitor in the South Atlantic routes. The Sargento Mora Antonio José de Barros died sometime in the beginning of 1797 while returning from a trip to Rio de Janeiro. His corvette sank around the dangerous Cabo Negro on the way to Benguela. The slave trader managed to swim for his life, but was later killed by the indigenous people of that region. At least, this is the version presented by some of his slaves who survived the shipwreck and the following attack and managed to return to Benguela. Barros' first testamentary in Benguela, José Antonio Ferreira de Fernandes de Sá, certainly assumed the management of the deceased slave trader's commercial house, but it's not clear the participation of his heirs in the business. We do know that Feliciano not only frequently sailed to Benguela, bringing goods and orders from old Carioca contacts, but also that he started his own family in Benguela. There is no much information, uh, uh, data about the Feliciano's family, just a brief comment in, uh, about his underage children in 1818, year of his death. There is no other mention about the other legitimate sons of Barros either. Once the process of the Justificações Ultramarinas was a request made by uh, the traders European family, not the African one. We also have no information about the relationship between Feliciano and his other five siblings, Joana, Rosa, Rita, Feliciana, and João. There is some information about Joana, the daughter of Francisca José, baptized in 1794. Assuming this is also the year of her birth, Joana was still a two-year-old infant when his, uh, her father left home for the last time. Rosa and Rita were daughters of the slave Vitória, Rosa and her mother lived in Benguela, but Rita lived in Rio de Janeiro at the house of one of her father's main associates, Frutuoso José da Cruz. Da Cruz also raised another of Barros' daughters, called Feliciana, who, uh, whose mother is not identified in the documentation. Besides these two girls, there, were, there was another uh, son of the Captain Barros who lived in Rio de Janeiro at the house of Narciso Luiz Alves Pereira, named João. The relationship between Feliciano and his siblings before and after his recognition is a matter that generates much speculation. Would João and Feliciano have, any, have had any kind of relationship previous, previously to the slave's manumission? Uh, they, did, uh, they lived within the same family in Rio de Janeiro, Feliciano at the house of Antonio de Araújo Pereira and João at the house of his son, Narciso Luiz Alves Pereira. What about Feliciano and Rita, who lived in Rio de Janeiro uh, at the house of Frutuoso de Jada Cruz? Uh, Barros fre frequently traveled to the Bahia da Guanabara, so he must have kept close contact with his legitimate children. Feliciano must easily have gathered information about his dad and, uh, at his own slave master's house. Uh, the fact is that Feliciano José de Barros became a slave trader, dealing, uh, working his father's old contacts, uh, contacts in Rio de Janeiro. He must also have built a, his own commercial house in Benguela, where he raised his family. He can be traced as an active businessman, a negociante, at the African port in 1818. Uh, in February 7th of that year, Feliciano was arrested at the Presidio of Benguela without any formal charges. The responsible for his arrestment was Antonio Lopes on Anjo, a man known for his many despotisms. Anjo was the oldest member of the local legislative branch, he was a vereador da Câmara do Senado, and assumed as Juiz das Ordenações following the death of the Judge João Antônio Cantargalo in the previous year. Anjo became later on one of the most important members of the Brazilian community operating in Benguela, seizing the position of Governor of Benguela for a short period in 1823. Uh, he 
is also accused of being an organizer for the separatist movement that agitated Benguela after the independence of Brazil from Portugal in 1822. Ant Antonio Lopes Anjos sent Feliciano to jail without pressing any formal charges for at least 10 days. The motives for his action might be related to Feliciano's commercial activities in Benguela. Anjos not only arrested the slave trader, but tortured him. Uh, the treatment given, given to Feliciano in jail horrified uh, several members of the local community and led to formal complaints from the governor of Benguela, Luiz da Mota Feio, about the decisions made by Anjo as juiz das ordenações. The torture suffered by Feliciano in jail crippled him and put him close to death. Fearing he, he, he would end his days in that prison, Feliciano requested to see his underage children and was granted. The children must have been accompanied by their mother or mothers and other of his slaves. Somehow, the complaints about the treatment given to Feliciano José de Barros had some kind of effect, and the slave trader was released from prison about 10 days after his arrest. This was enough time to break his death, and Feliciano had to leave the presidio on a stretcher. 15 or 16 days after being released, he did not resist the many injuries suffered and died at there are also rumors that Feliciano was assassinated, but no more details about the case. So I'll leave the rest for the questions. Thank you. <laughs> Next time, please I'll call on our discussant, uh, Suzanne Smorris from the University of Warsaw. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. to how there is a need for further research on the demographic experiences of pre-colonial West African populations. Whilst a great deal of attention has been paid to patterns of European morbidity or mortality in the white man's grave, including the experience of the men crewing the West African squadron, considerably less attention has focused on demographic trends exhibited by pre-colonial West African populations. And this is certainly true of patterns of research in Sierra Leone, where much work remains to be done on the structure of free town population and the surrounding hinterland in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, I won't say any more about that at that stage, but I did see many points of overlap here. The particular strength of this panel is the way in which the speakers made sophisticated use of techniques of nominal linkage to construct biographies of individuals based on fragmentary sources dispersed in archives in Portugal, Brazil, and Angola. I've been impressed by the richness of the personal data they've uncovered and reconstructed, and also the way these sometimes brief individual biographies, when viewed collectively, offer a means of probing broader patterns of economic and social behavior in the coastal slave port and its hinterland. Another characteristic of which the papers have in common is that they all reflect an emphasis in recent historiography on the importance of exploring the multiple and interrelated connections between Angola. Brazil and Portugal, and in particular how these connections impacted on Africa in Africa. So this recent historiographical approach is exemplified, and I'll start with um, Thompson's research through the case study that we've just heard about, um, Antonio José de Barros and Santo Luciano. Uh, Thompson, through these case studies, has offered fascinating insight into patterns of family formation linking Brazil and Africa and the complex personal and cultural identity emerged through this process. But through this case study, he's also raised broad questions about the mechanisms of slave supply from Angola at a time when the outward flow of enslaved Africans was showing a marked upward trend in the 1790s. As with Robin Wall's study of Francisco Felix de Souza, a trader operating at Ouida, this biographical approach provides a firm basis on which to understand the wealth and social and political influence of individuals profiting from this trade in human cargo. I particularly like the use of the brain marketing souls in this literature I've been reading, so um, that's why I haven't come across in the British context before. So through your case study, you've built up a dynamic picture of the strategies used by the merchant community in Benguela and Rio de Janeiro to build and sustain supply networks. Maintaining trust and business networks involve regular travel between Benguela and Rio de Janeiro, and a picture emerges of the merchants regularly crisscrossing the Atlantic a pattern which to some extent is reflected in the archival research undertaken by our speakers in the course of their journey. So I thought that was a nice parallel. Antonio, as we heard, succumbed to the perils of the sea, reflecting the very real dangers that merchants in Liverpool regularly caution their captains about in letters of instruction for slaving voices. And this reminded me of the work I'd done on the Liverpool 
use the phrase to explain that path of research that felt like chasing a dead man. And I just wondered if at times you felt that that was the case as you were following up leads and tracking down manuscript sources in those various archives that you visited. So in terms of the wealth and influence built up by Antonio Jose de Barros, his son Feliciano, and other merchants operating in Venezuela and Rio de Janeiro, I think it'd be valuable to compare this with the patterns of career development and profitability which have been extensively documented in other ports in the Atlantic world. I was thinking that some very good comparisons would emerge with the port of Liverpool, characterized by David Richardson as the premier slave trading city of Europe. And this comparison with Liverpool is aphrodite, as merchants from this port were trading with West Central Africa in the first quarter of the 18th century. This trade expanded rapidly in the second quarter of the century, accounting for 26% of all of Liverpool's trade. By the last seven years of the trade leading up to abolition in 1807, 30.9% of all Liverpool's trade focused on West Central Africa. Um, so I think this um, is a, an appropriate parallel. Um, there was a slip in trade with West Central Africa by Liverpool ships in the mid 18th century, and it was during this phase that Liverpool traders started to expand their trade in Sierra Leone. So, again, some connections linking different locations. In particular, um, so I think the revealing case history as you have traced for these merchants provides an entry into wider debates on merchant wealth and cultural identity. And here I'd recommend to you the work of David Pope, who has spent over three decades of meticulous research constructing the family background and career patterns of the Liverpool merchant community. From his research, he establishes that many, including John Dawson, established themselves as merchants by working as slave captains, and that many use their wealth subsequently to lay the foundations of social mobility through the education and marriages secured particularly for their children. John Dawson, who supplied slaves to Cuba through an asiento in the 1780s and 1790s, secured an Oxford education for his son, who was then ordained to the Church of England, and in many ways the subsequent generation tried to wipe out their connections with the slave trade. Pope traces the investment of wealth in property and links this to surviving buildings, including the Liverpool home, sorry, including the home of the Liverpool slave John Bolton on the shores of Lake Windermere. For those of you travelling in England, I'd recommend that hotel. Um, it's for a nice weekend break. Um, so I'd be interested to know more about the level of wealth generated by trade in Benguela and Rio de Janeiro and how this money was spent. These activities often left a fiscal imprint in the landscape. And a new book is going to be launched in September by Madge Dresser, focusing on the links between British country houses and the slave trade. So for those merchants who relocated to Benguela, did they see this as a temporary period of residence to generate enough business capital to retire or to establish a business on their return home? If it was temporary, how long did they, um, how long did they stay, presuming they survived? The phenomenon of temporary residence in West Africa is also characteristic of the Upper Guinea Coast, Whereas Bruce Mauser has demonstrated a number of English and specifically Liverpool traders established factories in the Rio Congo and Rio Nunes. Robert Bostock, Robert Bostock, a Liverpool merchant, sent his son to learn the business of slave trading on the Banana Islands, happy memories of some of us in the room, <laughs> off the southern tip of the Sierra Leone Peninsula. Following their return home, the wills of such traders were proved in the Diocese of Chester in the north of England, and I've seen several in which they have left bequests to named women and children in Sierra Leone. So I think there are these broad parallels to make, to draw. Paul Hare, amongst others, identified how leading African traders also sent their children to Liverpool for education in the 18th century. So, another theme emerging from the three papers is the interaction of Port Benguela with its hinterland. In other words, looking inland as well as outwards to the Atlantic. Thompson's paper includes some valuable comments on the strategies used by Barros to maintain effective supply routes with the interior, and I'd be interested to know what there is evidence which allows you to comment more fully on the identity of these African suppliers and the conduct of business at Benguela. You could profitably situate this work in relation to Lovejoy and Richardson's research on the identity of leading African traders in Bonnie and Calabar, as well as the mechanisms of trust and networking employed to reduce risk and indebtedness. It would also link well with Stephen Barron's work on the conduct of slave trading revealed through the diary of Antera Duke. Uh, so I think there's a great deal to um, link that work to this very valuable case study that was taken. So turning now to the papers of Marion Burry and Jose Curto, these are both based on an incredibly rich 
search volume parish register evidence documenting burials and marriages that have been away the population in the late 18th and early 19th century. In 1807, the population of Freetown was approximately the same size as Bengway, the roughly 2,000 before the influx of liberated Africans, and again, only a small number of Europeans, about 40 colonial administrators, and a very small number of women. And again, I was struck by comparing the two situations just how rich this material is that you have access to. Despite the fact that um, Freetown was under British control and had a cathedral from the 1820s, it appears that there are no surviving parish registers um, for Freetown until really the mid 19th century. And so I would feel very privileged if I could access the kind of material that you've been working with. Even so, um, so very rich material, but even so the registers that Curto and Burry are working with require very skillful analysis. Having seen some of the pages from the register, it is clear that they are badly damaged in parts with ink bleeding across large sections of the pages, and the writing of the Catholic parts is not always legible. Um, so despite their richness, it's not necessarily an easy source to work with. The registers in common with those kept in early modern England pose a range of methodological problems. Um, a few of these where common names exist, one of the challenges is gauging the accuracy of decisions for linking in entries for the same individual. Gauging how representative the entries are of the population is also one of the challenges of working with this type of material. Although the high infant mortality rates and death rates among migrant males in Bingway the main means that you're not just sampling an ancient population from the burial register. Turning to Joe's Day's paper, this is based, as I suggest, on a very skillful analysis of the parish register and census data. As the vast majority of people in Benguela did not leave letters and personal sources of the type that we might expect in other port cities, um, parish register entries provide incredibly valuable details of the circumstances of individual lives. One of the highlights of this paper, one of many highlights I should say, for me was the way in which the analysis of marriage entries reveals motivation and decision making in marriage and family formation. In particular, the strategic decisions of donors in Benguela in using marriage as a route to up social mobility. Their ability to pick and choose from among the men with clear penchant for military officers is reflective of the broader demographic context in Benguela, but it also points to an arena in which women were acting independently. The paper, for me, creates a picture of determined independent women rejecting notions of subservience. The choice of men who are outsiders was clearly one side of a mutually beneficial relationship in which foreign born men had access to family and slave trading connections of donors from the interiors, thereby enhancing their commercial prospects. I wondered though, in terms of the representativeness of the sample, if this was a self-selecting group that we mainly see donors who are getting married in the church because they are marrying um, Catholic outsiders. That doesn't undermine the value of the sample, so I just wonder whether that's um, worth considering. Burry's paper was equally fascinating. It's, it's, it's as it reveals how an early series of burial registers, although at one level a simple listing of the names of those who are buried, opens up the potential to analyze economic change, cultural practices, and social aspirations. Burial within the church was clearly a marker of high social status, as well as a hope for spiritual salvation and security. And I thought it was particularly valuable how Burry proved these patterns in a nuanced way by reference to the origins, gender, and status of the individuals recorded. I thought also the linkage of documentary sources with evidence on the ground adds to the richness of this research. And I'd be interested to see um, this approach extended to religious artifacts and also whether there was any scope for archaeological work, uh, whether there's scope for collaboration there. Um, also, the discussion of cloth used in burial was fascinating and could be linked to Colleen Krieger's work on cloth and its value in West Africa. So as with Curto's paper, we have um, really rich insight into the relationships formed between white men and African and mulatto women in ports, in a port with few white women. The evidence, again, for comparative purposes, the evidence provided in register entries is often much richer than we find in the English and Welsh context. In Anglican and Catholic registers in England, there is no reference to the administration of sacraments, nor of the distinction between categories of right administered. So I think in that sense, you have particularly um, rich body of evidence. So 
taking Curto and Burry's papers together, it is clear that these are part of a long-term project with tremendous potential to influence debate on demographic trends in West Central Africa. Through the construction of the databases that we've seen reference to, this research is already moving beyond aggregative analysis of numerical patterns, including seasonality of vaccines, marriages and burials, and years of crisis mortality, to a more comprehensive analysis of patterns of family reconstitution. Um, in discussions with Professor, Professor Curto yesterday, I'm informed uh, that there's even more exciting material that has a very good series of Batson registers for Venezuela. And when combined with the marriage and burial registers, these will offer scope to probe issues such as age of marriage and the characteristics of family formation after marriage. Again, some comparative material from the English context. Falling age of marriage was, according to Wrigley and Schofield, in their massive population history of England, 1541 to 1871, one of the main causes of the massive expansion in population from the mid-18th century. Paul Hare, although better known for his work as an Africanist and his studies of ling linguistic continuity in West Africa, played an active role in a long-running local parish register project in Chester, spanning the 16th to the 19th century, I can still picture the room in the history department of Liverpool, the Cheshire Parish Register Project, and he was the driving force behind that. And a particularly influential article arising from his interest in demography was one focusing on bridal pregnancy, which linked entries in the marriage registers and back some, back some entries to show that a very high proportion of women were already pregnant on marriage. This revealed cultural practices in early modern English parishes which accepted on betrothal that men and women could enjoy intimate relations or communication, I think was the word we had earlier. <laughs> Hare posited that the high number of illegitimate births in some English parishes could be linked to the abandonment of women by unscrupulous males following betrothal. Women as sparrows, I think um, is the terminology, the women abandoned. So when work begins on linking the marriage registers with the facts and registers, um, this is an area where you could um, probe those sorts of um, debates which have been developed in the English context. Okay. Um, in the English context, and I thought this was also an interesting comparison, demographic history has really flourished from the 1960s with the growing emphasis on the role of the family and household by Peter Laslett and others. A very influential study was undertaken on a small village of Colleton in Devon, which reconstituted families across generations using a sequence of registers. And really, because of the low level of social of, um, mobility in that parish, they could, in effect, reconstitute the whole parish. Given the high population turnover in Benguela we've heard about, such an approach is unlikely to be effective, but a partial reconstitution would be uh, possible in the future. Okay, so I think um, comparisons with the literature on demographic um, patterns in 18th and early 19th century England is something that would open up a number of relevant debates. So a couple more points. I uh, know I'm coming to the end of my time. Furthermore, of the registers, and this is something I was discussing with Professor Curto yesterday, if the registers could be linked in such a way to trace family links and connections into the interior, that would be particularly valuable and would shed new light on the identities of Africa. So um, in the back of the register I was informed there are also names of the godparents, so if you're um, the description of these examples still further. So in conclusion, these three excellent papers reveal the forensic qualities of research undertaken by each of the speakers. This work, while focusing on individuals and families, is however probing much larger questions.
Um, and this because we know that from the annual lists of marriages that there are far more marriages taking place than the ones that we find in registers. So the question is, why is it predominantly only uh, Donna's that are showing up in these uh, documents? Is there another set of documents that lists the, re the marriages of the l lower distinction or the lesser uh, uh, women? It could very well be because there's another church in, in, in this parish. Uh, there's another church between 1797 and 1828, okay? Uh, what happened to the registers there? Is that, are those the registers uh, of the women, quote unquote, uh, that are not represented uh, here? So, uh, it, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a problem, uh, but uh, if you focus in on these, uh, oh, if we have F1 register where there are so many of the same type of women showing up, there is a reason for this. In Brazil, for example, it's quite common to find different types of registers for different types of social uh, individuals. So the slave marriages are going to be found in, in, in one register, whereas the marriages of the uh, free are going to be found somewhere else. Is it the same thing that we are uh, confronted with here? I've got no idea because I don't know if that register exists. All I can tell you is that uh, that register does not exist in uh, the uh, archive of the archdiocese in one room, and it certainly doesn't exist in Big Bell. The church that was shown there, was the, the other church less attractive, smaller scale? Is, is this preference for a church that's more it, it, it would have been smaller scale because this mm. is the church. Mm. This is the seat yeah. of, the, uh, of the parish, so it's the imposing it's also interesting that at this time we have evidence that there are several priests who are associated with the church at any given time, um, maybe four or five, maybe six. Um, later on, when we get these accounts um, from European travelers in the 1830s, uh, they actually say that the church is, is pretty much obsolete, it's only used for funerals. So there's a, a shift there, and when and how that happens is really interesting, mm -hmm. and whether that happens in the church, I'm not sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for three. I was also, one of the things that, that really interested me was the, was the link that you made with the interior, because it's kind of uh, uh, counterintuitive when you talk about, about Portis and Portis de la Tenguera. And I was wondering if you, uh, especially um, Jose, had more uh, information about where the Donna <coughs> uh, wh where they came from, I mean, what kind of, uh, from what kind of, of uh, part of the, of the, what those geographically were from the interior. Yeah would come from and, and if it's possible to trace their, their social origin in one way or another? We can do it two ways. Um, through the, uh, right now through the burial registers but also through the marriage registers. So for example, you, if you have a donor from the interior who has her birthplace specified, you know, she'll, you'll have a Donna X uh, born in Bailu, for example. Yeah. Born in Giaca, B.A. So on. So you know specifically, and by the way, those are the areas that are essentially feeding the slaves into the, into the trade, okay? Mm -hmm. So you are able to start reconstructing those, those types of family ties between mm -hmm. the coast and the interior in, which that, in, in ways that was just not possible before, mm -hmm. or at least in ways that were possible, but it was sort of an anecdotal. Whereas now what you are bringing into the uh, picture is this type of serial analysis where you know, you, know you, you have a very large number of individuals that you can trace their origins into the, uh, in, into the hinterland. And it's the same thing with the burial uh, registers. Yeah, unfortunately sometimes it just says so town, that's it. But in some cases you do have specific, um, specific uh, locations and, and there's a couple of cases where they're talking about negotiating with the sawdust in terms of, of their social background from, from the interior, is it possible to trace it if they were closer to the big, uh, the big families of the, of the, of the uh, Umundu kingdoms, or, or if they were closer to, uh, uh, to families that had lines with uh, Portuguese merchants? And that would be the next trick. Yes, I guess. Uh, because the, 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 the way th these things happen is you have uh, these European Brazilian settlers, male settlers, going into the interior. And usually uh, taking uh, some daughter or some chief as a, a, a wife. And from there you have your sort of uh, uh, um, uh, Luso-African elite uh, emerging, especially the, the daughters who are then sent over to the other side, uh, to the coast for marriage. But it's even more complicated than that. The, 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 the captain of 
of uh, Key Lanes, which is one of these areas in the interior, in 1797, writes back to Bengala saying, listen, uh, the, uh, the people, the moradors, which is essentially are the, the, the local elites, right, uh, they, they are in the business of sending uh, uh, corpses to be buried in, in, in Nossa Senhora de la Tupac. Now that's a, that's a difficult thing to do, right? Uh, moving a corpse uh, overland. But also people uh, wanting to get married, they go get married in, in, in Bengal, and it will be the same thing with respect to that business. So y you know the kinds of individuals that are being sent from the interior into the, uh, 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 into the coast. At, at the risk of asking you to repeat something you said in the paper I didn't hear, I'm curious about similarities between the Dona and the Sinyar of, of uh, Senegal. Uh, if when the and the Sinyars were concerned to keep control of their own money, and and when they married. At a, at a certain point, the wealthier families tended to marry each other, and I'm curious whether whether there's a uh, within marriage, within Catholic marriage, whether the, the donor are able to maintain control of their wealth and perpetuate it. You have similar phenomena on the Upper Guinea coast with the mammies, uh, the, the, the heirs to the, but nobody's done it. any research on things like the marriage strategies. We just know that, that the families like the Lightburns and the Curtises uh, and some of the Portuguese families perpetuate themselves yeah, right. and they, they are still important today. Yeah. Um, well, there is only one Donna amongst the 100 that I've got uh, that remarries. So they marry once, but they don't remarry. Exactly, and and I would I, I would tend to believe that is uh, as a result of wanting to keep their hands on the bloody fortune. Okay, okay, but it's a little bit more complicated than that uh, uh, as uh, well. Um, may well be that they are not entering into institutional relationships after uh, they remarry. And by the way, if you only have uh, one Donna who, who is a widow who is remarrying in, in this case, uh, that it leads me to think that the, this generic view that we have once again of Donna's marrying like three, four, five, six different types, times, uh, that, that's going to have to be revisited. Uh, and that is predominantly the model for, that we have been given for Rwanda. Okay, so, and it may well be a strategy in the case of Bengala for these women to hang on to whatever they have uh, uh, accumulated without, of course, uh, uh, excluding the possibility that they may not necessarily be doing an institutional marriage, but they may well be entering into a common law marriage. <coughs> that, of course, I, I can't see in my, in my document. That's a completely different uh, relationship. But the, what I'm saying is, I, I think we need to get beyond just the, you know the looking at one particular woman here or there, as that's been the case largely for, for Rwanda, but not only, and start to develop these little massive serial analysis of this uh, uh, issue, which uh, will, I think, throw a great deal more light on that particular type of, uh, of uh, you know, independent uh, entrepreneurial woman uh, that has been the case uh, up until now. It's interesting that your uh, the the research on, recent research on Senegal, particularly by a woman named Lindsay Gish, who was doing a thesis on San, on San Louis on the slavery in the in the Seigneur, uh, also throws into question this notion. That some of the seniors may have accumulated money by multiple yeah. marriage of the mode to pay, uh, but in fact, uh, uh, she has more evidence of substan uh, substantial relations. The 
the seniors do, however, hold on to their money and their wealth. I mean, they control literally everything in the, uh, in in San Luis. They control the land. They control the boats. They control you know something like eighty percent of the slaves, and and that's a strategy. Yeah. I mean, these are women who that's right. keep a tight grip and not remarrying. I'm not sure of the position within the Portuguese Catholic society, but not remarrying sounds like, marrying once and then not remarrying sounds like a way of... Yeah, especially since all of these guys are dying like flies, right? Yeah. Okay, and you only have that one widow who is remarrying. And in terms of correlation, they're almost always listed, like, I think 18 or 20 or something like that of Madonna's are listed as widows of a single husband, and they're also all listed as heads of households. But as heads, heads of households. Heads of house. Yeah, and if you have, say, an Engino dying, they're listed as from the household of the widow Donna. Yeah. That's very, very common. Yeah. And they're always listed as being the widow of a single husband. The, the, pro well, the problem is that the one that you don't have this kind of rich data, well, it exists, but you can't get to it. Uh, the, the documents are in such bad shape in, 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 in Rio that the archive that has them will never let you see them. census of 1797, uh, it, it's the uh, geographical and historical archive in Rio. Mm -hmm. And if you would be able to, if, if Vanessa would be able to get her hands on that particular uh, document, which is a, a book this thick, uh, you know, covering some, uh, something like 10,000, 12,000 people, uh, that would be, once again, so a, a, a completely new window in, in, into this uh, issue because you could see a lot of the same, I think, a lot of the same patterns that are emerging here. But a definite rethink is is warranted. If you, I have a question for Stephen about the uh, registry of the birth of the slave son in Rio de Janeiro. Mm -hmm. Some have decided that uh, the son could be registered as the, as the son of the guy in, in Bengala. So what level of uh, reliability is there in these documents? Like, is that the decision of the mother? Well, uh, for what I have seen, yeah, uh, it's actually very common to register uh, this, this uh, infant, even though the father is not there, you know. Uh, and the register, it was not found. Mariana actually uh, looked for it, you know, and uh, in a recent article, she, she that says... Mean it's not there. Yeah, she, did, she didn't find it. Uh, and this is another hint that we have to look for it, you know, like in uh, the Freguesia da Candelaria and try to find but uh, for what I have seen in Brazil, it's very common to have this kind of uh, register without the presence of the father. Maybe because they travel a lot, they <coughs> I have another uh, uh, a case that I studied earlier uh, of this uh, slave trader that he is in Benguela, he dies there, and he leaves a slave that is pregnant in Brazil. You know, and when he's dying, he tries to uh, guarantee some uh, that he, she's going to be recognized as a legitimate daughter, you know. And I believe that in, in Bahia, she was probably also uh, registered as uh, his daughter, even though he wasn't there. So uh, I think that this, this is actually uh, something that you're going to find in other cases. I'd like just to make a comment here. Yeah. I would like to thank Suzanne for everything that she, uh, she said. I mean, I'm overwhelmed with ideas here. I, I, there's only, I, would, I would even like to take a look at your notes later because no. I, don't, I don't know if I got everything you said. That's uh, another paper. Yeah, that's another paper. But anyway, uh, there are two things that I would like to comment. First uh, is this uh, comparison with other uh, places like Liverpool, for instance. I'm aware of that. This is part of my research. But at the same time, I'm engaging in a PhD research, so I'm trying to get a little away from the Atlantic. Not that I will be able to escape from the Atlantic, you know, and go into uh, the interior, and this is uh, a question that uh, that you as uh, actually asked. And uh, this is my PhD. You know, I would like now to uh, make these connections that I made to Brazil uh, to the interior. And I know I have seen some uh, uh, documents where it shows that they uh, 
go into the interior and the same way that they come from Rio de Janeiro and stay some time in Benguela, but not forever, you know, they, they, it, it seems that they really want to retire in a couple of decades, you know, like in two decades they want to be out of there. I have cases of people that are from Portugal uh, and uh, they lived, they, they are Brasileiros because they lived in Brazil making commerce. They go to Angola and then they return and retire in Rio de Janeiro. Right. So uh, there, are, there are some documents ab about this, and this is really what I would like to do in my PhD. Uh, uh, the, the master's degree was about the Negreiros, so I would like now to talk about the Pumbeiros. Right? They are these guys that lead the caravans, and I know that Antonio José de Barros, uh, if he doesn't lead one caravan, at least he has a very uh, close partner, a compadre that leads these caravans, and in one document at least, I... Uh, the one that I got his signature from, uh, I know that he's in the hinterland. So uh, they go in and out of uh, the hinterland and they go in and out of this port. You know, they, there is a very uh, fluid kind of uh, community. Right? Mm. There lots of things I said were, there was just so much in the papers to comment on them with the excitement that comes across from the potential of this material. And it struck me that even though it's considered in the English context that the parish registers are very rich, it, the detail is really quite thin compared to what you have. So I just think there's this absolutely um, fantastic basis of taking these ideas forward. And, and then I just thought it might be interesting because um, particularly in terms of the study of the uh, slave trade in the North Atlantic, the emphasis is all on Liverpool and profitability. I just thought it some future research projects that yeah. um, I think it would be good to make those comparisons in the literature. Yeah, in, in the first moment I thought I would be able to talk only about the Pumbeiros in the PhD, mm -hmm. but I won't, you know, I mean, I have to keep talking about the Negreiros, about the Atlantic connection. I don't, I don't know if it's, uh, it wouldn't make a lot of sense maybe, uh, because the credits, you know, the money uh, and the goods in the case of a Benguela, more than le uh, cartas de crédito, we have uh, people trading goods, you know. These goods, they come from uh, Rio de Janeiro. And if we go deep enough, I don't know if we're probably not going to have time to do that in Rio de Janeiro. You could even connect that to, Lis oh, to Lisbon and to Liverpool and yeah. places like that. So actually, these credits, they come from Europe, they go to Rio de Janeiro, and then they arrive in Benguela, and then they go to the hinterland, yeah. right? Uh, this would be actually very nice to, to do all this connection. Let's see how much I can get up. Maybe this is a collaborative research project. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <coughs> uh, sort of, not a comment, maybe a, a silly or naive question. I was wondering uh, if, if, I mean, we've talked a lot about the uh, strategy of, of, of women, but I was wondering, what about men? Did they have any any strategy, or were they, well, obviously there were less, less women than men, but less, less women from, from, from Europe, obviously, but what kind of, can you read strategies from on their part in, in the archives, or is it? I decided to focus on the women because they're, they're, they're really, well, numerically speaking, they're, they're an important group and they seem to be exhibiting certain types of, uh, of patterns, right? So I, I focused on them. Uh, I haven't fo if, if I'm focusing exclusively on, on, the, on the men, uh, what kinds of patterns would uh, uh, emerge out of that particular type of focus? I mean, it would be interesting just to see, wouldn't it? You know, so if you have all of these foreign guys coming in and marrying women, you know, so how are they, you know, what kinds of patterns emerge out of their choices? What are they looking for? Yeah, okay. And that I haven't gone uh, into yet, but, you know, I, I, I can almost bet you anything that these guys are coming in looking for women who can integrate them quickly into the, the economic activity, right? Uh, and, you know, and that means being integrated quickly into the culture, uh, being integrated quickly into the trade networks uh, that go into the interior and all, and all of that stuff. But I haven't done that. Okay. Uh, there's, a, sorry, there's a much more diverse group of men coming in than there are women uh, available for, for marriage. And that's why I focused on that, on the women. Great, final word, a great conversation between Portuguese, Britain, and <laughs> thanks to the panelists, thanks to Suzanne, thanks to Vanessa, thank you for your time.